My name is Regulus, and today I'm uh, interviewing Oriel Def Defenestrate. Excuse me if I got that wrong. <laughs> I did my best. Um, he's an occult artist and performer. He's uh, performed in several different shows in the United States and England and Australia. I think I read that on your bio. Um, yeah. He's... And you're where I live. <laughs> So I figured we'd let him discuss, like, so what is your, uh, what is it that you're trying to express with your performance and your art? Like, is there a specific, like, message or is it, like, just a lifetime pursuit or, like, what do you, what does your work mean to you? Um, well, it's, it's all art as far as I'm concerned. Like, I mean, whether it's visual art, like, you know, well, what's called visual art, usually like as in painting and sculpture or performance art, um, or music, it, to me, it's all kind of one thing. And, um, it's like different media with one in one field, um, which is, you know, creative expression. So, um, yeah, I've always done it. Um, I've always, been highly creative and drawn to express myself in this way, but the the means vary. You know, the the media changes a lot, but um, I find that helpful because uh, the different media seem to cross pollinate each other. If I get um, if I get stuck when I'm doing some music, for example, I might switch to painting and then get some new inspiration from that, that and then feeds back into the music. Or you know, uh, lyrics of a, po a poem. A poem might become lyrics of a song, which may then become part of a film. Or you know, so there it sort of goes around within uh, the general theme of, of um, artistic expression. And I mean, uh, I know this is uh, your podcast. Generally, particularly lately, has been about the esoteric and magic. Um, but for me, there is actually a little little difference between art and magic. I mean, I guess it's to do with the way the way I do art, but um, yeah, the more I uh, the more I delve deeply into creative expression, uh, the less it or uh, well, the lines between that and magic uh, become more and more blurry. I guess like uh, they used to be sort of distinct, more distinct fields for me that overlapped, but they're becoming more and more just merged. And I guess particularly with the performative aspect, because um, I think theatre is intrinsically ritualistic or like should be. And, uh, you know, its roots are ritualistic in ancient Greece uh, with the theatre of Dionysus. And, um, yeah, ritual is often theatrical as well, like, you know, ceremonial magic. And so you've, you've got this uh, natural sort of um, crossover between those fields. It's just a matter of, I guess, whether there's an audience or such, but um, uh, or rather, whether there's an incarnate audience or not. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, yeah, I've always done my art with a magical perspective, and um, you know, in a evocational or invocational manner, and that's uh, yeah, that's uh, sort of become a kind of slipstream now where. It's also one thing, like magic and art has really become a, um, uh, yeah, like one thing. It's hard to say where one ends and one the other begins. And more. I would, I would say I, I agree with that perspective. I've, uh, in my studies in the esoteric, I've learned that, uh, you know, the irrational expression of humanity is what brings us closest to our magical roots. It's, not necessarily rooted in logic. It's more rooted in the thing is we don't understand, but we try to express anyways. And I find that art is one of the greatest expressions of the irrational experience of man. We're trying to relate exactly. what we. Yeah, exactly. And, and the subconscious, like art is a fantastic way to access the realms of the subconscious, you know, as well as other kinds of ritual. It's, um, it's, uh, yeah, you can, and imagination also plays a, a great role in, you know, art and magic because it's, um, it's like you're bringing things from the imaginal realms into manifestation. You're manifesting them, you know, on a stage or on a canvas or, you know, on a screen. Um, so yeah, it's like the creative act is, is an act of manifestation and, and also an, 
an act of of evocation or invocation because you're bringing something through from transphysical realms into the physical, which you know, I think what magic is all about for the most part. I would agree with that 100%. Uh, so what uh, what got you into the occult world to begin with? Did you get raised by people who were already involved? Did you like have a coming to Jesus moment, but for this type of a uh, thing? You're like, what, how exactly did it happen for you? Uh, no, quite the opposite in terms of uh, being an environment that fostered occultism. I had uh, very conservative uh, parents um, and family in um, Western Australia where I grew up, and which is also quite a conservative place generally. And, um, yeah, I wasn't in contact with anyone um, who uh, believed in magic as an actual thing. You know, that was uh, as far as my parents and all the people around me, you know, until my late teens, um, all the people around me, like magic was just a thing of fantasy, you know, of uh, books and films. It wasn't anything that was uh, considered an actual thing whatsoever. Um, I I always sort of intrinsically felt that, you know, that it was real. But uh, I have felt alone in this. And so I sort of just delved into, you know, into art and into, um, you know, into, I guess, you know, fantastic media that, that uh, where I felt there was there was something more to it that uh, it wasn't just a creative expression of the imagination that there were actual you know myths and archetypes um, that that were that were real they were always real to me and you know it was like I you know in my late teens when I moved to the east coast of Australia and started actually connecting with you know people f- for whom magic was a reality it was like wow and you know I'm not um i'm not alone in the world um in terms of you know my inherent perspective and um yeah so so that was uh that was quite amazing and then you know once i realized that i i um well then i i gradually started developing you know more of a sense of community with it but it also gave me i guess um you know just realizing that there were people who considered this a reality, you know, took it to another level for me personally where I could actively work with it rather than sort of, um, you know, do it as something that was uh, just, you know, art or media or, um, you know, uh, you know, that suddenly I could say, yes, this is magic. Um, it was like it, it gave me in, in a way to express what I already believed that, that you know, that I wasn't the only. Um, yeah, so suddenly it was like, okay, well, I'm not such a freak after all. Or actually, more more accurately, I wasn't the only freak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to agree with that also. I've found that uh, when you find a community that supports you and has the similar perspectives that you do, you're able to use them as a mirror that helps you grow rather than something Mm -hmm. that reflects the negative side of yourself, right? Like when you're surrounded by people that you have disagreements with regularly, that you don't really see eye to eye with, that can provide a negative reflection. But when you're in, especially in the magical world, when you're surrounded by people who are practicing, they're sharing their joy, their creative expression, and you see that being reciprocated with your own action, that's where we grow. That's where we find our our light, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, and I guess also because you know I grew up you know in pre-internet days as well for the most part. So it was like I didn't even you know I mean there's a, a lot of people in isolated places or conservative area who might grow up without immediate community around them, but they're still aware of these that you know there are people into the same stuff and they can find them quite easily even if not in their immediate environment whereas I didn't even have that so until I actually started meeting people you know then and you know that was around the time the internet was starting to grow and um, so then I started connecting with people in America and Europe as well and um, you know then I started traveling overseas realizing that there were even more people into the kind of things that I was into you know over here so um yeah then i i just kept going back and forth for 20 years between um australia and um and europe and england and america and you know traveling a lot also to india 
And, um, yeah, eventually uh, that became too much because I was just uh, sort of spending, you know, uh, half to two-thirds of a year in Australia and the, and the other third of the year sort of just traveling around doing performances and um, stay, always being in other people's spaces. And eventually after a few decades of this, I was like, okay, I have to just uh, get a place in Europe and move over here. So, um, yeah. Is there any uh, point in your life where there was like a real, like uh, you felt the connection with your magical innate, ma- innate magic? Like you realize that this is real, like it's not something that's like an idea, it's something that you actually can is physically existent in your life. Like, was there any moment that actually cemented that in your reality, or was it something that like you just always had the innate belief in? Well, I've I've always I've always like inherently felt it was real, but yeah. Um I guess there there was a few moments where it felt like turning points where I was beginning to express it in a more outer way. I remember doing my um, first rituals. Well, my first rituals have actually called rituals um, in a you know a warehouse squat in Sydney when I first went over to the East Coast, and I um, yeah I did a, a pan invocation, and you know a few weeks later a homies invocation. And yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of things sort of went into effect, um, quite immediately from that. And, um, yeah, interestingly, they're, you know, they're two of the main deities. Uh, I still feel are really, uh, close with me throughout my life. And, um, yeah, I feel like the, um, the effects of those, those early rituals and that, um, you know, that enthusiasm that a neophyte has of just putting their, all their energy into this this you know new thing sort of uh, really opened up a lot and um, you know continues continues to um, affect my path now. I actually feel that a lot of the early uh, rituals that I did um, continue to unfold in some way, and I don't um, I don't do as much uh, sort of ceremonial magic as I used to. Um, in you know in my private practice as in i don't do a lot of spell casting or results oriented magic anymore because i you know um when i was younger i sort of felt like oh okay i want this i'll do this and you know you gradually learn that um the gods sort of know what you need more than you do or more than you think you do yeah <laughs> and um yeah so Yes, I've become, I guess, um, you know, more mystical and magical in, in a way. Um, and more, you know, more, yeah, doing art and allowing things to just emerge from the subconscious. And I still do ritual, but, uh, if I want to create a sort of change in my life or myself, it's less specific these days. It's not like, you know, okay, I want this particular result, you know, you know, this thing to happen at this particular time or this thing to come into my life. It's more just like, okay, I want to change in a particular field, you know. So, you know, say I want I want to um, become, I want to have better communications with people than I would call on Hermes or, you know. So it's more like I will call, um, I will call gods or spirits um related to the energies I want in my life rather than asking for a really particular thing. That makes sense. I mean, even the Greek philosophers talked about the uh, form or the isness of something. Like if you have a table, there you, there's a specific table in front of you, but there also is the word in itself means every table that exists. So we have, like, if, if we want to work with a specific ideology and improve a specific perspective, being able to call on something that describes all of that in one allows us to be able to grow in that. So I totally relate. It's like the, yeah. uh, we, we have deities, deities from the past that were the re- like lords of specific realms and calling on them allowed us to be able to help ourselves grow in that realm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what, so was there a major point when you like decided to get into the performing arts or is it like, was there an opportunity that was presented to you that brought it about? Like, how exactly did you get started with? 
No, not really. I've always been very do it yourself with that kind of thing, actually. Um, like I've never sort of, uh, like I've never joined a theatre company. I just like started my own kind of thing <laughs> and I have just sort of, um, yeah. And I guess because of this, uh, you know, being very much into all these different kinds of arts, um, you know, I didn't want to just uh, act in somebody else's play. I wanted to like write a play and perform in it and then, you know, get other people in to that. So, um, yeah, it just seemed like a natural kind of evolution of, uh, of working in all these different fields to, yeah, to start performing, uh, yeah, performing solo sometimes, but also with other people. And, um, yeah, I just sort of kind of made it happen and I could sort of, I especially had to do that in Australia because there wasn't a lot of sort of, you know, alternative um, stuff going on around me. Um, so, yeah, I just uh, I, I sort of created created the the, um, the avenues myself for the most part. What would you say a biggest a big challenge has been in your uh, creating creating your own system or, or creating your own dr- drama? Cl- your own theater, uh, I don't know what the correct word is here. Um, your own group and your own, like getting performances and finding like places that'll have you perform in. Like, it has you had any major challenges in that process, or is it like everything's just kind of lined up the whole time? Uh, no, it's uh, it's really difficult sometimes, definitely, um, in a logistical sense. I mean, because of uh, just sort of doing it myself and not really going through, you know, any sort of official channels or normal ways of doing things um, and just sort of working out a lot of it out as I go along, um, not always having big teams, uh, not working with professionals because of not having the money to do that. Um, you know, there's all sorts of challenges. Um, yeah, often it's difficult, especially financially, uh, but, uh, you know, that I also feel like, I'm really glad that I took that path, um, you know, rather than, you know, studying drama or, you know, working through some other theatre group first or whatever, because I actually, I actually like working with, with non-actors with ritual theatre. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, if you work with a really good actor, of course, that's fantastic, especially if they understand, um, you know, magic and, and the ritual nature of, of, uh, theatre, then that's great. But, um, uh, working with people who are into magic and who are into ritual but aren't necessarily actors as such, uh, I think it's a really interesting thing because, I mean, a really good actor is, is invoking anyway. You know, they're, they're calling someone or something that's not themselves into themselves. Um, so yeah, to, I, I guess somebody with a magical perspective can do that, uh, more thoroughly. Um, because they're actually thinking of it as invocation and they can open themselves, you know, to a kind of possession, um, more sometimes than an actor can. And, um, yeah, some, some quite unexpected, uh, results happen from that. I saw that you've written a book. <laughs> you want to talk about that a little bit? Like, uh, what it's about? Like, uh, what inspired you to write it? Uh, um, I've written. I've written quite a lot of books, actually. Um, I did a, uh, a four part, well, written, drawn. Um, I usually combine, uh, combine my, my drawing and painting with, uh, writing with my books. Um, but, uh, yeah, I did a, I did a fourfold, uh, series with Fulga in England, um, from 2008 to 2015. That was the, the Telequadrivium series. And that was like, uh, for our chemical art books. I mean, mostly art, but with text to support it and explain the symbolism in the, the drawings and paintings. So each book was, um, uh, represented a, a uh, color phase of alchemy. So there was a red book, a gold book, a black book, and a white book. And the white book was also the colors, the quarter per bonus stage of alchemy. And um, the four books fit together so that as well as reading them individually, you can also, also lay them out in a mandala and then um, turn the pages around and when you get back to the beginning, turn them again and, like, you read around the four books in a spiral and then a secondary narrative emerges from that. 
so yeah, that was my first sort of uh, big uh, project in terms of uh, creating books because I had this opportunity to work with Fulga, who uh, um, produced really beautiful books. So I thought, what's the um, you know what's what is what is the nature of a book as a magical object, which is um, which is different as an art form from, say, an exhibition or a website or you know other other ways of, of presenting your your visual art. And I thought, what's you know what's the nature of a book itself? And I realized magic is you know in the turning of the pages and the relationship between the pages that that's specific to a book as an art form. So I really sort of delved into that and what I could do with that. I think um, that's a fascinating yeah. concept. I've never even considered being able to read separate books as one book. <laughs> that's that's a yeah. novel, novel and intriguing. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. it was a big project for sure because um, I had to sort of map out and ghost the whole thing before I even started working on the first book. But yeah, that was a while ago now. Um, more recently, I've just just last year had this book, um, Assages, as published, and that one's still in print at the moment. Um, that started off as a book of my esoteric poetry. And then I started writing, uh, in prose or sort of semi prose, poetic prose about the magic of language and, um, you know, how poetry, uh, poetry is an expression of the magic of language because it's about rhythm and rhyme and, uh, wordplay and, you know, all the nuances of, of, uh, of that kind of expression rather than just um, abstract ideas that are expressed, you know, usually more in a prosaic form. Um, so, yeah, I wrote a lot about the magic of language, but I wrote it in a way which is magical. So it's kind of like, a, you know, it's um, not just a, a passive work to be absorbed. It's, um, you know, it's uh, in designed to, to trigger, um, trigger things. And um, I wrote a lot about, yeah, it's, it's also um, illustrated with a lot of my um, paintings and drawings and um, some photos of my sculptures and installations as well. But the um, I realised that it was actually kind of ironic uh, writing this book about the magic of language because I was writing a lot about how, about the vibrational properties of language and about how, uh, language spoken is more powerful than language written on a page because it has the actual vibrational potency rather than just the meaning that you get when you see it on a page. And so I was writing about how when it's spoken or if it, even if it's orated, then it, ha it has this more vibrational potency and that if it's sung um, or put to music, then that increases still. And then I thought, well, it's kind of ironic that I'm writing a book about this. So um, then I ended up putting an album out with the book as well because a lot of the poems that were in the book uh, I'd already turned into songs uh, with voice and violin or used as lyrics and jams with other people. So there's an album with the book which uh, has uh, you know, spoken poetry but also sung poetry uh, sometimes just by me, sometimes in a soft ensemble. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a diverse sort of musical and sonic journey as well as um, you know, one of ideas and invocations. That's amazing. Uh, what I mean? Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I've also been on that same path where, uh, you know, the ideas on paper or on Facebook or however you want to see it, those ideas are... Uh, in the air, they're still in the ethereal. They're, they have it until they're spoken. It brings the vibration into the world and it connects with the world around us. And there's that reciprocity, or recipro reciprocity. <laughs> that word's hard. Uh, with the rest of the uh, world around us, that I can give or take if it is correct or incorrect, right? Like, uh, and then on top of that, not only is the way we speak a, ma a factor, but how we speak. And like how things are put together, just like you were saying with rhythm and like with music, it's a follows a system of repetition or re like the mm -hmm. vibration and the frequency repeats itself with time as, along with the words, which increases the harmonic frequency, in my opinion. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
It's interesting too, like looking at uh, older languages, like if you, you know, if you do mantras or spells in uh, Sanskrit or Hebrew or ancient Greek or something, you can feel that there's a more sort of uh, intense sort of vibrational potency to them because they're old languages and they're closer to um, the meaning and the vibration being aligned because, you know, languages would have started from people going, oh, you know, what's that? You know, if they've got an object and, and you know, or a thing and they're like trying to work out how, how to, you know, how to name it, they're going to be like sort of feeling feeling what it feels like and then try and translate that into sound. It's a, oh, it's a, you know. Yeah, and then, yeah. <laughs> And that that actual vibration and that sound relates to how the thing feels, but then that gradually gets diluted through time because you know then uh, that word goes to another culture who changed it slightly, or it goes to another place who might be removed from the thing it was being described, and it gradually, you know, gets filtered down. And you know, in modern languages, particularly ones like English, it's like very a very uh, diluted sort of filtered language that's come through all these different um, processes all these you know aeons of time and and through different cultural lenses and so it doesn't have that that direct uh, vibrational thing it's yeah there's all sorts of uh, strange um, things in it but but I mean it has it it also has its own magic because of that um, because of the fact that it's kind of like a weird um, you know, conglomeration of all these different roots from different cultures and, and different places. And, you know, it's got Latin, it's got Germanic roots, it's got all these different influences and sort of unraveling those roots and the different vibrations and how they fit together and how they've merged and mutated into new, new expressions. Um, you know, that's really interesting. And I think, I think poetry sort of, brings out those aspects because you can you know you can play with the sound and how they feel as well as the um just the abstract meanings it's less abstracted than than um, the written language for sure i'll be sure i do to, think like i was gonna say i'll be sure to put links to your books uh and any like other performances that you want to share on the in the description of the video for our listeners thank you yes as you were saying uh, I lost that thread now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, like me personally, I'm a more of an academic minded person. Like my practice comes from theory. I first work it out in my mind and then I practice based on that. And a lot of what I have practiced and learned is based on self expression through intentional language. Like literally every single word that I use, choose to use to express myself has meaning from the barest word to like the eyes to the a's to the it's to the them's to the us. Like, Every single one of these words has an extremely profound makeup of what it is. Like us is a group, word that you could use to describe a group, but it's more so a, something you relate with. It's something that's meaningful to you. Whereas the word I, we think we use it so easily, easily, so passively, but it, it's our entire being. It's our entire being described with one letter. <laughs> And we try to yeah. reduce these things to make them less meaningful. But I feel like it's more of like a, a lack of education in our, in our world where we don't understand the value and the weight that these syllables and these letters have when we express with ourselves with them. And I really appreciate yeah. you for using the language in a way that's beautiful and informative. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a really interesting thing, and um, it's been fascinating for me moving to Europe as well because um, you know, language. I mean, I grew up on a, a giant monocultural island. Um, you know, I guess America, a bit of one of them as well, but maybe not quite as much as Australia. <laughs> and um, it's uh, you know, I haven't really been exposed to a lot of language, um, you know, as a child. And most people in Europe, you know. A lot of them grow up having like three or four languages, you know, spoken even in their household or their neighborhood, you know, or maybe even more. And, um, you know, now I'm living in Belgium, which is like bilingual, you know, officially. And yet, you know, most people speak at least three languages. And, um, you know, I feel kind of really kind of stupid because when you grow up in that kind of environment and you're, 
your brain gets used to that, all those different uh, ways of expression, it's quite natural, I think, to pick up uh, new languages too and see, you know, the common roots between the different ones. But, um, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's really fascinating, like, uh, finding all the different, all the different, uh, languages and, you know, the common roots between them. And as I, as I'm starting finally to, to learn bits and pieces of different European languages, um, and seeing how, you know, uh, how you actually think differently as well as even speak differently, like, uh, with different languages, you know, it's like, you know, uh, the way we express ourselves, even internally is, uh, directed some, to some degree by, uh, you know, the language, uh, we use. And yeah, it's a really fascinating thing. Um, and, you know, some languages, uh, particularly Asian languages are more orientated towards groups and collectives and they seem to have, um, a different kind of social cohesion towards, uh, Western countries that are very sort of, you know, eye orientated. Um, so yeah, I think this, the way, uh, language affects our reality, you know, socially and environmentally is a fascinating thing. I agree. It's also like the foundation of systems. We use language to create systems. That's how we like create new ideologies. We create, you know, uh, like groupings of beliefs and put a label on it, like social socialism, capitalism, like all these things are just groups of ideas with a label slapped on it, right? Like, uh, and that's magic in itself. That's literal magic, you know, without us being able yeah. to express things in a way that we can uh, share them and relate with them with each other, we wouldn't be able to express that concept or those ideas in the first place. Somebody had to have created it. Like, Definitely. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, language is a creative act. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you have written books, you've written music, you act in the performing arts, like you're a very profuse person who puts yourself out there and you like practice your magic through these forms of ritual of action. Uh, is there any like theory inside your mind that like you have that you put behind this or is it all more of like a, like an action for you? Um, no, there's definitely theory behind it. I mean, uh, I don't really have a consistent way of working, um, though, because, you know, some, some things I create more from the subconscious and some are more composed, some are more directed on more conscious processes. And then, you know, there's varying degrees in between as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it very, like what the intention of the piece is varies. A lot, you know, just according to what what I'm doing at the time. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, when I when I do performance, I you know, I would like to create some kind of change in in the in the, in the audience, or at least some of them who are open to it there, um, you know, as well as in myself, um, or at least you know, instigate a process that could later unfold into that. So connection is the basis of what you're going for then is like being able to connect with people to be able to help them experience something while you're experiencing what you're going what you're doing yeah yeah i guess so yeah yeah i mean it's like uh yeah i mean sometimes it's sometimes it's a real it's a conscious process where it's like okay i want to do this i want to create this kind of change other times it's like things i've uh you know other rituals I've done in the past sort of unfolding um, and yeah it becomes a it's sort of gradually become more intuitive I guess as I as I continue on my path um, well <clears throat> I think you've answered all the questions I had I can't really think of anything else to ask is there anything you want to say before we uh, end the interview is there anything on your mind burning desire to share Um, uh, well, I guess, you know, it's, um, the usual thing to end these things with, um, sort of, uh, talking to the listeners directly and, um, you know, if there's anyone out there who, you know, feels they have, uh, some kind of creative potential that's not being expressed, I would just say go for it, um, 
don't sort of think, oh, I can't do that. I'm not a, I'm not a painter, or I'm not a this, or I'm not a that. I just, you know, if if you want to do something, do it. And um, you know, it might take a while to develop the skills, um, but the sooner you begin, the uh, you know, the more that's going to go underway. And you know, imagination is is the most important thing. And if you, you know, if you have the passion for it, and um, yeah, just express yourself and. Um, let the magic um, unfold. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I feel the same way, honest. I never even, I've been doing this for 17 episodes. This is my 17th episode, and I've never considered talking directly to the audience. So thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> <laughs>